Our speaker tonight is Dr. Laura Lyons. She's the author of Lyons' Guide to the Career Jungle. And, you know, the, the headline on her, on her piece says, Defy the Odds. And believe me, when you hear her story, you'll see that she persevered despite some major, major obstacles. She is today a terrific educator. She's been, uh, she's spoken all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Laura Lyons. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is such a pleasure to be here tonight amongst kindred spirits because I too have had to go through the same process you've gone through. And when you start talking about uh, age, that I can't get a job because I'm too old, it hurts my feelings because I'm 72, so there's no hope for me if you feel that way. <laughs> a woman was on Steve Harvey the other day and she was 56 and she was saying, I'm so old, Steve. He says, so am I, so what do you want to do? <laughs> I am so proud of you, proud to be here and to share my message with you. When I go to South Africa, and I've been there maybe 20, 30 times, and the last time I spoke to a soccer stadium audience of about uh, 100,000 people, and one of the things that they have nicknamed me in South Africa is a messenger of hope. I have a lot to cover with you tonight. One of the things that's important to me is to recognize those who are role models for the message so that it gives you hope. You can look at other people and say, oh, if she did it, I can do it too. And she's right here sitting next to me. So we're going to have some honorees tonight. Um, I'm, my book is out there, and we've reduced the price of it for you because we know that you're job seekers. And my T-shirts, and some people already have won some T-shirts, and they will be getting those tonight. My amazing personal assistant, um, is out there as well, uh, Suzanne Reinbach, and she's just amazing. Give her a hand. <laughs> she is one in a million, and I'm hoping she'll go to South Africa with me the next time. I am, this is something I've wanted to do all of my life. Um, when I was five years old, I used to line up empty chairs in my mother's kitchen. <laughs> And I used to talk to those chairs for hours. I would also beat them. And I would tell them, sit up there, boy, and take that gum out of your mouth. And stop reading that comic book. You're never going to get ahead. And I would talk to them for hours, empty chairs, empty chairs. And my father would say to my mother, there's nobody in there but her. <laughs> and so they finally even took me to a psychiatrist. They said she talks to empty chairs for hours. And then when I got to go to South Africa, to this 100,000 soccer stadium audience, my husband said, my late husband said, that's what those empty chairs was all about. <laughs> when I go to South Africa, uh, I'm often brought there by major organizations from Hyatt to Chase, etc. And I'll have uh, 100 people, 500 people in my audience, and um, this year, and then two years from now, I'll go back over there, and some woman comes running up to me, pulling on my coattail, Dr. Laura, Dr. Laura, I got to speak to you, I got to speak to you, and I say, so what did I do? And she says, I was a cleaning woman at Chase the last time you were here, and today I'm the manager of Tellers, and she says, and it's all because of you, and I said, no, honey. How many other people were in that room with you? And she says, uh, uh, 500. And I said, did all 500 do like you did? No. You're special because you made a difference. And you went out there, you took the message, and decided to do something with it. I, people ask me all the time, are you going to be, uh, you're going to have a PowerPoint? And I say, no, I am the PowerPoint. <laughs> all right? <laughs> I am the one who has defied the odds. And I think that PowerPoints are great things, but to me, they're very academic, they're very generic. But what I like to do is find out what are the problems in the organization that I'm going to be speaking to. And what I found out about this organization, and I learned it from some of your leaders, I also learned it from my interaction with many of you. I'm a resume reviewer, and I'll review anybody's resume in this room who wants your resume done 
and 99% of the people whose resumes I've read got the job, if you change it. Now, like with my boyfriend, who's Jewish, and I said to him, he, he was applying for a job to be a Hertz regional manager. And on that resume, he wrote uh, that he had served in the Israeli army. And I said, first of all, sweetheart, remove that because it happened before Christ. Although he doesn't believe in Christ, we know that was before Christ. <laughs> and I said, so, you know, it was like in 62. You don't go more than 10 years back. Secondly, it was irrelevant for what he was applying for. Well, of course, he didn't listen to me. No man does listen to a woman. But in any case, he didn't listen to me. He kept it on his resume. And guess what Hurt started doing? Investigating whether or not he was a terrorist. <laughs> Because he put on there that he served in the Israeli army, which is totally not related to working for Hertz, rental car, as a regional manager. <laughs> and so the next six months or so, Hertz spent their time trying to find out if he was faithful or loyal to the United States of America. And of course, he is, but he never got the job, because that's what they put their energy into. So one of the things that I say to people is, number one, listen. So, and, and sometimes when I'm talking, people will hear me say something and they'll turn around and look at the other person and smile like, she's talking to you. No, I'm talking to you. <laughs> right? So don't, don't turn around and look at someone else. Born in Birmingham, Alabama in 1942, at the height of civil rights in America. Birmingham, as you know, was the bullpen, and that's Bull Connor, of the civil rights movement. I was born, ladies and gentlemen, victim of a triple whammy, black, poor, and female. Only one of those could I change. I could change being poor, but I could not change being black, and I could not change being a woman. Now, one of my students said, yes, you can. <laughs> uh, I could not change those things. And at the time that I was born, it was hopeless. I was born in a shack, delivered by a midwife, and slept on the floor. My mother used to make the mattress out of corn husks. She'd take the corn and shuck the corn, stuff it, and that was your mattress. And 14 kids sleep on that same mattress. If one kid urinated, we were all wet, you yeah? know? Uh, no hope. Absolutely no hope. She had a bathroom in the back, a toilet in the backyard with 14 other families, always filthy. Toilet paper was a Sears Roebuck magazine. No hope. The odds were against me. Riding on the back of the bus, although the front of the bus was <coughs> vacant, all the seats in the front were empty, but if the sign was there that said, Whites only, you had to sit behind that sign. And I could never understand why all the black people had to stand up behind the sign and all these empty chairs were there. My first experience was with, with racism as I really got to know it, was being in a grocery store, or uh, no, the Piggly Wiggly store with my mother, and I wandered off from her as she was shopping, like any little kid and went over to the water fountain, this big white water fountain that looked so cute, and I went in and started sipping water. This clerk rushed from behind the counter, slapped me as hard as she could, and my mother grabbed me by the hand, rushing out of the store, and she's apologizing to the clerk all along, and I said, Mom, why would you apologize to someone for slapping me when you've never slapped me? And she said, because you broke the law, honey. The law says that you cannot drink water from a fountain that had a sign above it that said, for whites only. You could go to jail for that. Now, I could have gone through life angry with white people for the rest of my life. Oh, I would be able to read if it weren't for white people. I would be able to be ahead if it weren't for white people. If that, I would be, wouldn't be emotionally disturbed today if that woman hadn't slapped me. I can still feel that slap, <laughs> 72 years later. But you know what I did? I walked out of that store at uh, prime, primary school age, and I thanked that white lady because I made a resolution that day 
that as long as I lived, no one would ever victimize me again because I couldn't read, because I couldn't read that sign. I was born into a family of illiterates. My father signed his name with an X until the day he died. Nobody in my family could read. I used to think it was great that my uncles used to give me a nickel to get the coke out the machine because I thought they were so proud of me because I knew how to insert the nickel, push the button, and get the bottle out at the, but it was because they couldn't read the sign. When my uncles were driving along the street and I was reading from the billboards, they were so proud. They said, keep reading, because they couldn't read it. My uncles and my, my father many times drove through um, boards, you know, these, uh, where you come, when you're driving your car in and you have to stop. They just drove right through because they couldn't read the sign that says stop, take ticket, and wait until this thing lifts up. I decided to become a scholar. I decided that I wanted to become educated. And I had no hope of that, no chance of that. Because <coughs> my family had no money, my parents had no education. So, and when I used to sit out on the curb at night, we had no electricity. And I used to sit on the curb at night and under the street lights and I would read because I wanted to be educated. And my friends would say, she thinks she white. Who she thinks she is? Only white people can read. And I said, and to this day, people in the black community often say to me, because I'm vegan, and you know, when I declared that I was vegan to my family, they said, you ain't gonna eat no chitterlings, <laughs> no pork chops. She thinks she white, because the only time my mother ever saw uh, broccoli and cauliflower and avocados was in the white woman's house where she worked as a maid. I'm saying this to you today, ladies and gentlemen, by way of saying to you, Laura Lyons stands here before you tonight as the quintessential odds beater. I have defied every odd that was placed in front of me, every barrier that was placed in front of me. When I started applying to colleges, I was turned down from many of them because Tuskegee Institute and uh, Tennessee State and so forth, they didn't take black people who did not have electricity, and I didn't. I read by the streetlights. I'm saying to you tonight that there is no such thing as failure. I read the other day that Bill Gates says that he will never hire anyone or invest in their organization unless they've failed at least three times. Because if they failed, he knows that they know this time is like to be the passing time. So I just hope that my story tonight will be one that will inspire you to resolve, to believe, and to know that there is no barrier placed in front of you that you cannot overcome. Don't and never, ever, ever blame what happens to you on something that you cannot change. I cannot change being 72. I cannot change being black. I cannot change being a woman. So it didn't make sense to me to start using those as an excuse. Because the moment you blame your failure on something that you cannot change, you give up your power to change it. You give up your power to change it. My boyfriend always blames the, the fact that he's short. <laughs> and I say to him, maybe it's because you can be a jerk. <laughs> uh -huh. You can't change being short. <laughs> but you can change being a jerk. <laughs> he tends to be a bully, as shortness will do to you sometimes. <laughs> yeah? He, he, I, I go in negotiating, he goes in bullying. And then he doesn't understand why he doesn't get what he wants. And he's constantly saying, age, I'm 72, and I think he's 65. 66, okay, so he blames it on age, he blames it on uh, Jewish, and he blames it on size. 
And I am saying those are things that he cannot change. But he can change being a bully. He can change over-talking other people. He can change making himself look good at other people's expense. He can change being arrogant. He can change walking in there and acting like he knows more than the people who are hiring him. But he doesn't want to take a look at that. He wants to blame it on something that he cannot change. And there's nothing that makes me more upset, more angry and annoyed when people blame their misfortunes, their failures on things that they cannot change. I can't get a job because I'm disabled. I can't get a job because I can't hear, I can't walk, I can't. One of my best assistants has lost one eye. Lost it when she was a little child, but you would never know it. She never claims it. She never says anything about it. It's nobody's business. She's, nobody knows that Maureen is lacking one eye till I told on her tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying to you is you are in charge of your fate. Yes, it is twice as hard for me to get what I want as a black 72-year-old woman than it is for a 35-year-old white girl. But you know something? Since I know that, get on with it. <laughs> Since I know I got to be twice as good, same thing with looking for a man. You know, a 35-year-old can beat me at it until he meets me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then he never wants to do 35 again. <laughs> yeah. I was turned down by an agency not too long ago because she says to me, I, I was looking for one of these fix you agencies, matchmaking agencies, and she said to me, what age range are you looking for? And I said, a 60-year-old to a 75-year-old. And she said, no 60-year-old will date you. And I said, show him to me. <laughs> show me to him, you know, because I'm the best he's going to ever find. And that's what you've got to go in there with, that attitude of positiveness, the attitude of I can make it. When I ask my students at Berkeley City College where I am the job developer and job placement officer, and I say to them, so when you go in for an interview and the manager asks you, why should we hire you, what do you say? They raise their hand. What do you say? Why should I hire you? Because I'm broke? <laughs> <laughs> That's you and 22 million other people, right? <laughs> and I should care about you because you're broke? That is not the answer. And do you know that when they walk out of my, my uh, class, every single one of them have said that that's the number one thing they learned, was how to answer that question and not say, because I'm broke. Nobody cares about you being broke. When I ask you the question, why should I hire you? I want you to say to me, because it would be one heck of a mistake if you don't. Because when you see what I can do, how I'm going to change the dynamics of this organization, how I am going to increase your profitability, how I am going to decrease your losses, how I am going to improve your bottom line, how I am going to enhance interpersonal relations, how this organization, you know, Chase don't send me to South Africa because I think I'm cute. <laughs> you know, the, the first time I went to South Africa, I was on a plane with a man from England. Because in those days, you couldn't fly direct to South Africa because of the embargo. So I had to go to London. And when the flight stopped in London, a man got on the plane and sat next to me. And it turns out that we were going there for the same thing. We were on our way to South Africa to speak at a national convention. At the end, when we got off the flight, we found out we were in the same hotel. And that night, we met in the lobby. And we had a little glass of wine, et cetera. He had one too many. And he finally. <laughs> And I, and I asked him, how much were they paying him? And he told me, and he was being paid like three times more than I was being paid. He got up there with his PowerPoint, did his thing. I was very hurt thinking, oh my God, he's making so much more money than I am. But guess what? 
I've been back 30 times. He ain't never been invited back. <laughs> so that's the point. Yeah? You can look at the short term or you can look at the long run. You can look at your losses or you can look at the potential for winning. The bottom line is this. There is no real such thing as failure. Everything that happens to you is a part of the plan that the master of the universe placed for the process for you to go through to get where you got to go. I had 40 properties. I've lost about 20 to foreclosure. Now, as I was about to jump off the 14th floor, I couldn't imagine because it was just crumbling. Just, you know, I couldn't stop it. And I, I, you know, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and when I came home from the Peace Corps, having served two years in Turkey, the Peace Corps gave me a readjustment allowance, and I took that money and bought my first property, and then I multiplied it. I, and I, I was just terrified, but I finally learned that this is a process that you have to go through, that failure is a lesson, number one. And there really is no such thing, but if we just want to use that word tonight, it's a process. Number two, when you lose this job, when you lose this interview, when you lose whatever it is you feel you should have gotten, it's because the master has some bigger and better for you. And you have to believe that. I don't know who your God is, and it could be very different from my God, but one thing I do know is that whomever it is that you believe in in a higher power did not leave you here abandoned. He didn't put you here to make you lose. If you don't win, then the wicked prevails. And there is no God that would allow that. But God honors your choices. And if your choice is not to show up to EUCCC meetings, if your choice is not to take another interview because you got rejected from the last one, if your choice is that you just kind of give up and you don't want to participate anymore, that you just go home and you're angry, annoyed, hurt, sense of entitlement, the world mistreating me, the world don't owe you nothing. So everything you get is a blessing. To be here today, to wake up this morning is a gift. Be grateful for it. And I am simply trying to say to you, as an odds beater, if it hadn't been the Ford Foundation decided to do a study on whether or not black people could learn, and they went to the poorest schools in the South, in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and they went to the counselors of those poorest schools, and they said, give us one kid in this school that if they were given a shot, if they were given a chance, they could make a difference in the world. And my counselor chose me. They found me working as a live-in maid. Because when I graduated from high school, when the white kids graduate from high school, they have uh, recruiters there from colleges in the lobby, lined up, trying to get you to go to their college. When the black kids graduated from high school, we had recruiters, but they were to be maids and they'd have brochures of tree-lined streets and beautiful houses and a flush toilet on the inside? Yes, I will take it. And my own bed? Yes, I will take it. So I went to as a, work as a live-in maid, making $18 a week and bus fare whenever I wanted to go home. I wanted to continue to learn to read. And the woman of the house, I was the best maid she'd ever had, and she didn't want to lose me. So every night when she saw me in that bedroom in there with the light on after I'd put her seven kids to bed, she knew I was in there plotting my escape. <laughs> and she didn't want to lose me. So she came in one night and she said, you are forbidden to burn the, my electricity after dark. Okay, that's your PG&E bill, I understand. You can forbid me from doing that, but you can't forbid me to read. So I simply went downtown, bought myself a flashlight. Every night I turned the light out, put the covers over my head and read. 
Amen? Amen. I mean, isn't that what you want? But see, I, I could be telling everybody, I could read if that remember that white woman that wouldn't let me read. She wouldn't let me read. I'm, I'm such a victim. I've suffered so much. White people didn't like me. Her husband, because she was an alcoholic, so she couldn't service him. And every night he came to try to come into my room and rape me. Well, I wasn't going to leave my $18 a week job. That was a lot of money in those days. I simply went downtown and bought myself a big old boat lock and put it on my door. Every morning came out and smiled at him like ain't nothing happened. I am simply saying to you, defy the odds. I'm not saying to you that they're not against you. I'm not saying that they're not barriers. I'm not saying that there's not unfairness. I'm not suggesting that there's not injustice. I'm not suggesting that there's not partiality. I'm not saying that there's no favoritism. I'm not saying that if you're beautiful and skinny, you might get it faster than somebody who's a little heavier and thick, as my friends like to say. But I'm saying that somewhere out there, there's something for you that the Creator has designed for you that no one can take from you. And so when the Ford Foundation came up with this idea of paying for the college education of 25 of the poorest black kids in the South, I was one of them. And I went to school in New Orleans, Dillard University, graduated from Dillard, and joined the Peace Corps. Again, my family was <laughs> furious. You spent all that money to go to college and now you're going to get a job and pay $75 a month. <laughs> but the Peace Corps, I learned more in the Peace Corps than I've learned in college, for sure. And those are some of the other things that you need to think about. Think about service to your country, service to yourself. I grew a lot from being in the Peace Corps. I came back from the Peace Corps and Peace Corps volunteers are pretty much treated like military uh, men and women. We get pretty much the same benefits because you've served your country. And as a result of that, I was able to get a grant, go to NYU, and get my postgraduate degrees. I am here tonight to say to you that there is no barrier that you cannot overcome. There is no blockage that you cannot beat. I like to tell this uh, story. A woman and her boyfriend had been living together for 10 years. And she woke up one morning, he woke up, and he woke her up. And he said, sweetheart, I had a dream last night that I asked you to marry me. What do you think that means? She says, it means you got more sense when in your sleep than you do when you're awake. <laughs> and the goal here is to make sure that we have more sense when we are awake than we are when we are asleep. Uh, I was in a show concert in San Francisco the other night, and this woman had on a mink coat, and she was walking into the concert, and another woman leaned over to her and said, do you know how many animals died for you to wear that mink coat? And this woman said, do you know how many animals I had to sleep with to get this coat? <laughs> Sometimes, brothers and sisters, you got to sleep with some animals <laughs> to get that coat. <laughs> this is... Um, Success is an attitude, and it really is. It, it's an attitude. I don't care how academic you are, how brilliant you are, how capable you are, how knowledgeable you are, if you have a bad, lousy attitude, you're not going to get anywhere. Attitude is 80% of success. Ability, knowledge, are only 20%. Attitude is 80%. And tonight, I want to award this one 
And I don't know if he can step away because my videographer there, Tom, I want to thank you for volunteering your time to be here tonight. And uh, this t-shirt will be yours. The last time I was here, I read from my book, which is available to you tonight, Lion's Guide to the Korea Jungle. It took me five years to write this book, and it was um, a collection of all the data that I've received as I go about uh, interviewing people and talking to them and working with organizations and finding out ways in which we sabotage ourselves. And so th this is one of the questions in my book. Um, and the person who answered this got a t-shirt. Let's just see if anybody can answer it now. Who am I? Who am I is the question. You better take good care of me. Perhaps at times you don't think too much of me. But if you were to wake up some morning and realize that I had gone away and left you, you would start the day with an uneasy feeling, to say the least. For me, you get food, clothing, and shelter, and I take care of your kids and your spouse. I give you steaks with all the best trimmings. But I'm exacting, too, and I'm jealous. You make ugly remarks about me, and you mistreat me, and I don't like that. And considering the fact that you need me as much as you do, you need me for material things, you need me spiritually, I wonder, why do you neglect me? What if I were to leave you completely? Your happiness would be seriously affected, your bank account would shrink, and your husband might even leave you or your wife. So after all, I'm pretty important to you, so why don't you cherish me? Who am I? Right Higher here. Power. Higher power? That, that's true, too. You're my job. Come on up here and get your T-shirt. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to need another T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, yeah, and we can get, okay, we'll cool. size it for you afterwards, okay? okay? You see soon, she'll give you the size that you want. And I have one t-shirt here for someone who has worked so hard to help me put this on. And she was one of the people who even first invited me. Rita Carlson. Where is Rita? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rita? I can call on this woman any time of night, day, you name it, she's there. And she just got a job where she's stopping crime, and I love her to death, and I want you to give Rita a hand. She's gorgeous, she's fabulous, and she is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, was going to go to uh, the woman who won it the last time. Where is Pat? Come on up, Pat. Thank you. This is, this is Pat, uh, how do you pronounce it? Sid Noor. Sid Noor. Sid, Pat, you want to give a little testimony? What has this program done for you? It has been wonderful. It has kept me sane. I don't have to take medication because I can't go out on the side. Thank you. And, and Pat, if that's... <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr., who was one of my mentors, I met him when I was 13 years old in a Baptist church in Selma, Alabama. And he says, if a man is called upon to be a street sweeper, let him sweep streets like Michelangelo painted. Let him sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Let him sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Let him sweep streets so that all the hosts of heaven and earth will proclaim, here lived a great street sweeper. That's the message to you tonight. Be the best at what you do, whether it's looking for a job or whether it's maintaining a job. You have got to wake up every single morning with the resolve that today is the day that I'm going to defy the odds. Today is the day that I'm going to be hired. Today is the day that I'm going to make a difference. I just got a job. I, I haven't, hadn't had to have a traditional job in 40 years because my real estate took care of me, my motivational training took care of me, but when the market crashed, there was no more money in motivational training, and there was just 
my real estate crash, I had to go get a job. I got a job four years ago, I'm 72 now, so that tells you how old I was, at Berkeley College as a, I'm a, what do you call it, I'm a career coach and job placement officer. I also teach students how to write resumes, I teach them how to uh, do job interviews, and basically what employer expectations are, which is what my book is about. And that book was a bestseller when I first wrote it. It's on employ your expectations. And if you read it, I promise you that it will change your life. So it, it's, 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 it's not a piece of cake, but then neither are you. You came here ready and prepared to beat the odds. And I guarantee you this, the creator would never put something in front of you, a barrier, that you could not overcome. He's not mean like that. He doesn't operate like that. Any barrier that God put in front of you, he also put the ladder there for you to climb. And I've met a lot of people in this organization. I've even tried to work with a couple. And I can tell you, therefore, I know what goes on here with some of the people. I interviewed somebody from this organization not too long ago. And in the middle of the interview, they said to me, uh, first of all, the cell phone rang. Never do that. Leave your cell phone in the car. OK? And you know, I was interviewing a woman the other day, and she had a cell phone on the desk, on the table while I'm interviewing her. And the phone rings, and she turns to it and answers it. And she says, oh, those are my grandkids. I got to take them to the carnival tonight. <laughs> and, and, and this person answers the cell phone, and he says to me, that's, uh, he said, do you know what honeydew is? And I said, no, what's honeydew? He said, that's my wife saying, honey, do this. And I'm saying, you need to tell your wife that I'm going on a job interview. You don't show up in shorts. You don't show up late. You don't make excuses. And some of you right here in this room are so sure you're not going to get the job. Oh, well, it's just going to be another rejection anyway. So let me just go on in there late. Let me just go on in there with my night clothes on. I ain't going to get it anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going through the motions because Dave told me to go. He said I had to go, so I'm going through the motions. But I ain't going to get it. I know I ain't going to get it. And when I walk in there and see 20 other people sitting in there waiting on the same interview, I know I'm not going to get this. I see, I have just, the, just a different attitude. I walk in there and I see 20 other people waiting on the same interview. I'm getting it. I'm ahead. You know? So, I, I mean, I'm the same way with men. You know, I put my picture on the internet and I figure he going to want me. You know? And if he doesn't, his loss. And I meet that every day. You know? I went out with one Sunday. And the first thing he did was he ordered one dinner and two plates. Now, if there's any man in here who can supersede that, call me. <laughs> <laughs> one dinner, two plates, two forks. You know? I am here to tell you tonight that you cannot make enough excuses to make you feel better, because you know you're wrong, when you lie to yourself. When you wake up in the morning and you say, I have a headache, and the only reason you really have that headache is because you're afraid of that interview. Anyone in this room who would like for me to coach them or to read your resume, I will do it for you at no charge. Just contact me. Refuse to take rejection personally. These are business decisions. They really have nothing to do with you as a person. I failed an interview not too long ago. I went for uh, a job placing blind people in jobs. Because that's what I am. I'm, I'm a master at job development. I have to get out there and meet the employers and develop the job. I have 25 students every term that I must place in a job. And I cannot make an excuse. And what upsets me was when my boss told me that when they get fired, I have to place them again, or we have to give the money back to Sacramento. 
I thought, but I just, I just placed her. She just got fired for having her bust out. And my boss said, you got to place her again. And I have to do that, and, and I can't argue with it. I can't say, well, that's too many. It's too much. It's what I have to do. And when they come in there with resumes that are irrelevant or dressed unprofessionally, I still have to overcome it. Yeah. Don't take rejection personally. Just keep on going. Hang with people who you, whom you want to be like. Losers hang with losers, and winners hang with winners. Be with other people, and find a mentor, somebody who you can trust, whom you believe in, and you're going to listen to. Be willing to make sacrifices. You might even have to relocate. You might even have to dump that man who ain't doing you no good anyway but hanging on to you. Or that woman who ain't doing no good but spending money that you already ain't got. You know, I don't know what, what changes the creator is asking you to make. But I do believe that all these crises that we are going through, it's for us to make some changes in our lives. And what we have to do is find the lessons in our losses. Ask the creator, what do you want me to learn from all of this pain? When my husband died of 30 years, a wonderful marriage, I, I couldn't believe it. Why would you take my husband away from me at such an early age? There was a lesson that he wanted me to learn. We were living overseas, and when my husband died, I had to move back to California. Ended up getting a job at Berkeley City College uh, when the economy went bad, and I, this is what I do now. And ironically, it fits in with what I've been doing all of my life. Ask the creator, what are the lessons you want me to learn in this crisis? Create a vision for yourself and carry that vision with you at all times. Say, this is what I want to be, this is what I want to do. I was the first woman dean in the state of California. I was the youngest dean ever appointed in the state of California. This is a girl from Birmingham, Alabama, from the back of the bus. If I can do it, if I could come from water fountains marked for colors only, just think of what the Creator has for you. 72 years of hardship, of living through the worst crisis in America for black people other than slavery. And look where I've come today. God brought me from the back of the bus, from the red clay mud hills of Birmingham, Alabama, to Walnut Creek tonight to stand before you and bring you a message of hope. He said, get up there tonight, Laura, and tell them what hardship is really like. <laughs> and tell them if you could come from where you came from, there's no telling what's waiting out there for them. I just have a couple of more things, and then I'm going to open up for questions. Get your priorities straight. Some of us, our priorities are screwed up. Taking a honeydew call when you're in a job interview, answering your phone when the, when the potential employer is calling you with your dog barking, your baby <laughs> crying, yelling at your husband, and I'm calling you about a job. Don't answer your phone if you're not in a position to be interviewed. There's nothing that infuriates me more than when I call a, an applicant and she, Sit down, boy. Move over there, Duffy. And I'm trying to talk to her. Clear the path. I don't answer. Do not answer the phone. Call me back or trust me to call you back. Don't be so arrogant that you're not willing to do anything. You know what I say? If it's not illegal, immoral, or fattening, I'm your girl. <laughs> huh? And some of you are too arrogant. 
Walmart called me the other day because they con these companies contact me because they know that if I run my hand across their head, they're all right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so they called me, they're looking for a mystery shopper. You know what a mystery shopper is? So I knew a young girl who was looking for a job, so I called her and I said, would you like to be a mystery shopper at Walmart? She said, where? I said, San Francisco. She said, I ain't going to San Francisco. I said, you don't need no passport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like you need a passport to go to San Francisco. Yeah. When I was interviewed for this job for the blind, I failed the interview because I sat there, and instead of talking about my ability to place blind people in jobs, I said they're talking about having been a dean, having been a CEO, having been a vice president at Kaiser Industry. And when I, this man interviewed me for 45 minutes, and when I got up to go after having bragged about myself, he said, now what did you say you do again? 45 minutes I've been talking about myself, and he didn't know what I did, so I knew I'd lost, but it's because I didn't say anything related to what he wanted. I could have even told some blind stories, because I, several years ago, many years ago, I developed diabetes. I was 65 pounds heavier than I am today. I developed diabetes and I lost my eyesight. Today, I have 20-20 vision and I don't even need glasses. But I'm a vegan and I take care of myself and I lost 65 pounds. As opposed to walking up there making excuses about, Lord, diabetes runs in my family. <laughs> I get so tired of hearing people say that diabetes, my mother had 14 kids, 10 have already died from diabetes, and I resolved I ain't going to be one of them. Amen. I don't eat flour. I don't eat wheat. I don't eat sugar. I don't eat bananas. I hate to say this white people, but if it's white, it ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> Really? What are the foods that kill us? The white foods, rice, potatoes, pasta, bread, sugar, salt, they white. Sorry. <laughs> what are the foods that heal us? Avocados, spinach, arugula, they're green. When I go to Birmingham and I ask my family for an avocado, they go down to the store and they get the avocado and they bring the Crisco with it. They say, here, fry it. <laughs> <laughs> Whole Foods has built one of the largest Whole Foods stores in America, it's in Birmingham, Alabama. When I went down there a couple of years ago, and I said, take me to Whole Foods. I want to go and see this new Whole Foods, the biggest one in America. My family drove me to Whole Foods. They sat in the car. They said, we are not going in that white folks store. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying to you, but you know something? They ridicule me when I go to my sister's for Thanksgiving. She, you know, she's going to say, here comes the white folk here, you know, the girl that only eats the avocado. But guess what? I'm 10 years older than she is. She's dragging around in bedroom slippers, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I don't wear them if they ain't six inches, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just simply saying to you that you can decide. You know, my students tell me all the time, Dr. Lyons, you're telling us to kiss butt. And I say, yep, all y'all kissing, but you're just kissing the wrong one. <laughs> I'm telling you to kiss the one with the power to pen. The one who can do something for you. Peer pressure. You're so scared. You know, if somebody called me today, and I've done it recently. Woman, people in my building needed somebody to clean. One woman in my building got sick. She needed somebody to cook. Two PhDs, and I am not too proud to go over. One of my friends walked in and saw me down on my knees scrubbing my neighbor's floor, and he said, Lord, I thought you gave up being a maid. I said, never, honey. Once a maid, always a maid, and I'm good at it. <laughs> not too proud to do anything as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or fattening. And that's what you need to do. And stop talking about you got to make the salary that you used to make. Oh, I used to make $50,000, and I ain't taking nothing less than $40,000. Let me tell you something. You are not coming down from $100,000 a year. You're coming up from zero. <laughs> OK? Stop it! 
Stop it. Stop pretending. Stop faking. Stop looking for status. Stop covering yourself with crap. Get real. Take what you can get. No matter what it is, 50% of something is better than 100% of zero, and I didn't need a PhD to know that. So if you are making zero and somebody offers you a job at $10 an hour and you turn your nose up at it because you're used to making $40 an hour, and you're going to go back home to zero? When my son first graduated from UC Berkeley, I only have one child. He's 40 three years old. He just came here last week to celebrate his 43rd birthday. He's a screenwriter in Los Angeles. But when he first graduated from Berkeley, he was offered a job at CBS. He went for the job interview. I called him and I said, did you take the job? He said, no. I said, why? He said, mom, they're paying minimum wage. I said, so what are you doing now? He said, watching all my children. <laughs> I said, and they are paying how much? <laughs> and I said, let me tell you something, boy. If you're not smart enough to know that 50% of something is better than 100% of zero, I want you to go back up to UC Berkeley and tell them your mama want a refund because they turned out an idiot. <laughs> how dare you turn down $10 an hour at CVS to go home and do nothing? You don't have to stay. He said, but mom, they just want me to clean the shelves. And he said, you of all people, mama, you're not the kind of person to tell people to deviate from their career. I said, we're not talking about a career. We're talking about a job. And that's different. We're not talking about your passion. My students always talk about this is my passion. This is my passion. I ain't here to pay for your passion. The hell with your passion. That's your passion, not mine. I am saying, what can you do for me? And what are you willing to pay the price for what I can do for you? Get your priorities straight. Sometimes you may have to give up something. You may have to give up where you live. You may have to give up a relationship that you're in. I don't know what you have to give up. But I am willing to make sacrifices for my goals. And finally, failure means that God has a greater purpose and plan for you. And until you declare that you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, you're not going to get anywhere. I was sick and tired of being 65 pounds overweight. I was sick and tired of all the effects of diabetes. I was sick and tired of, you know, penny pension, sick and tired of the life that I had, and I resolved to make a change, and that's all I'm asking you to do. And it costs. There is a price, and you got to be willing to pay it. Get rid of your fears. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And your dreams have got to supersede and transcend your fears. You have got to be willing to pay the price for success. I paid it in Birmingham, Alabama. I still pay it today. I bought a home in, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, vacation rental. Well, a home for myself, but I rented it when I wasn't there. And when I went to get the little thing that I needed to enter the, um, the complex so that it would let up and let my car in, the woman said to me, um, we don't give those to people who only come once a week. And I thought she was talking about the fact that I was back and forth from California to Arizona. You know, once a week I'd go over there, one week I'd go over there, and one week I'd be back. And so I, thought, I said, oh, but this time I'm staying longer mm -hmm. than a week. And she said, well, why don't you ask the family that you work for? And I said, honey, I'm not even mad at you. Because a few years ago, you would have been right. But I went from made to made it. <laughs> uh -huh. And I ain't mad at you, because you're right. <laughs> I, was, I, I owned several uh, units in the same complex. And one day, I went 
I wanted the vacuum cleaner from one of my rentals for my own unit. So I was, went over, took the vacuum cleaner, and I was taking it across the parking lot to my place. The next thing I knew, one of the neighbors had called the cops that I was stealing the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so the woman comes out to me and she says, what are you doing with that vacuum cleaner? Where are you going? What are you doing? I said, miss, I own this complex. <laughs> yeah. So you're the one who's in trouble. I don't get angry when people uh, mistake me for being a maid or when people mistake me for being second class because if you know who you are, you don't have to brag, you don't have to boast, you're just confident. Because I walk around in, you know, with sometimes my pajamas on and my whatever, I am who I am and you are who you are and you are going to defy the odds. I wanted to recognize some people who I've worked with in here who have impressed me. One of them is Stephanie Coniglia, and I didn't see Stephanie tonight. Uh, the other one is Joe. Yes, con yes I'm saying congratulations to her. And let me tell you something, the ones who I've coached, and I'm going to take some of the credit for it, I know Dave's going to take all of it. <laughs> and you all get it, EUCCC is going to take a lot of it, but I have had an opportunity to coach some of the people and very grateful that they have made some changes. Joe Perkins is another one. Reader, I've had a chance to interact with. Uh, Maximus is going to get an award tonight. Amazing man. Give him a hand. <laughs> Stephen Slick Harris. Slick, Slick. Got a job? All right now. So what do y'all do? Abandon the EUCCC when you get a job? Uh, that's a good thing. Monique was the one who uh, got, helped, got introduced me to this organization. She got a job back east. Rhoda Parham was also someone that I've interacted with in this organization, and I'm very, very proud of her. Uh, I would like now to give out the uh, awards of the people who've been selected to be recognized as role models for this organization. We took the time to do these certificates and frame them to honor you. The first one goes to the gentleman and it says, the certificate of achievement acknowledges that this person has been recognized as an outstanding role model for Experience Unlimited Contra Costa chapter. On this 22nd day of October, and it's signed by Dr. Laura Lyons and Dave Botano. Brad Beach, past president of EU, and ordained minister, Brad led the organization for two years. Can we get somebody to snap some pictures of us? His positive outlook and inspirational talks have encouraged many a member to keep looking for work. I'm so proud of you. Don't try to steal my job, Brad. That's, that's what I do. Congratulations. Nobody cares, Nobody cares. Thank you. Thank you. The next one goes to a former executive with the Gap. Carolyn keeps EU on track by enrolling new members, reporting volunteer hours to the state, and re running the office at East Bay Works. Her organizational skills are invaluable. This role model is Carolyn. Holston, co-director of business operations. They didn't tell me you were all so gorgeous. I want to um, just share with this, you this from my book. Um, so there's some people leaving, they may want a book. <laughs> Life is a challenge. You have to meet it. Life is a gift. Accept it. Life is an adventure, dare it. Life is a sorrow, overcome it. Life is a tragedy, face it. Life is a game, play it. Life is a mystery, unfold it. Life is an opportunity, take it. Life is a journey, complete it. Life is a song, sing it. Life is a promise, fulfill it. Life is a beauty, praise it. Life is a struggle, fight it. Life is a goal, achieve it. Life is a puzzle, solve it. And when the God breathed the breath of life into our nostrils, he gave us the power to meet this challenge. 
I conclude with just this little story. A woman walked into a bar, a good looking woman, and this man said to her, my God, you're good looking. And she said, I wish I could say the same of you. And he said, well, lie like I did. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> My point to you is, sometime you got to fudge the truth. God bless you and thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Laura. That was great, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming.